Welcome to another episode of Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. We are carrying on the legacy of Deacon John Perk, who passed away and is with our Lord. He passed away on March 9th, 2024. And for a number of years, he was host of a radio show on the Catholic Radio Network. I'm here with your host, Father James Kelleher, internationally known as the Rosary Priest and a lifelong friend of the deacon. Father Kelleher is from the Order of Salt, Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. Deacon Perk was also in the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. And I'm your co-host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall, the Curious Catholic. We hope to learn more about our Catholic faith, how to share the good news of our faith, and how to become the perfect saint on living in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. Each week, we'll share the fruits of our Catholic faith so that you, too, will live in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father Kelleher, how are you today? Doing great, Gary. It's great to be on this show again with you. I know. The fan mail that's coming in is is amazing. So if you'd like to write some fan mail to Father James Kelleher, go to salt.net, and you'll see the address for Our Lady of Corpus Christi here in the sparkling city by the sea. Hey, Father, it is confirmation season. We are confirming young Catholics everywhere. Moms and dads are getting teary-eyed, buying Bibles and rosaries for their children and grandchildren. In fact, uh, Darlene and I will be traveling to San Diego, where Darlene is sponsoring our beautiful granddaughter, Sienna, in her confirmation. Now, a lot of parents just think, okay, I got to get that sacrament. I got to get that X in the box. And they don't maybe not know exactly what the sacrament of confirmation is. Can you enlighten us? Yes. The sacrament of confirmation has its origin in Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the Virgin Mary and the Twelve Apostles. And he filled them with his power, with his love. And in confirmation, the language that's used is when a person is confirmed and the bishop says the words, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enters in a very powerful way. The Holy Spirit's already present in the person, but this is a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the person is strengthened for service in the mystical body of Jesus Christ and strengthened to be a defender of the faith, to be a real soldier of Christ. So this is a very important sacrament so that we can really live out this baptismal calling that we've been given. Yes, and a tremendous sacrament and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Father, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's been influencing us throughout these radio shows. And in fact, the Holy Spirit brought Father Kelleher and Rear Admiral Hall together as we were standing in line for a Southwest flight. I was A-27 and he was A-28, and it started a long-term friendship, which is now on the air with you in Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. So, Holy Spirit, Father, that Let, powerful prayer, hit us with the Holy Spirit prayer. Okay, let's pray this together. I'll say a phrase, and if everyone in the listening audience repeats, we're all asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, strengthen our will, so we can put all of these things of God into practice in our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit. Soul of my soul. Soul of my soul. I worship and adore you. I worship and adore you. Enlighten and guide. Enlighten and guide. Strengthen and console me. Strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do. Tell me what I ought to do. And command me to do it. And command me to do it. I promise to be submissive. I promise to be submissive. In everything you permit to happen to me. In everything you permit to happen to me. Only show me what is your will. Only show me what is your will. Amen. Amen. Again, Father, that is a powerful prayer, and I hope our audience who re- repeated it along with us finds the power as well. So we've been talking, speaking about power and influence. We've been talking for the last three episodes about John Paul II. Again, we have learned more about the Pope. We've learned more about his strength, his surrender to our Lord and to his courage and his vision. 
and making real friends, not just fans, but uh, friends, whether it be around the campfire with young people or in secret correspondence with Mikhail Gorbachev. He made a difference in the world, and we can all learn from him. And as I said, you and I are becoming even closer friends, not fans. In our discussion about John Paul II, what keeps popping up? Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yes. Our Lady of Guadalupe is very important in the life of John Paul II. Imagine Gary being at the Vatican shortly after John Paul II was elected Pope, October 16, 1978, and he has his advisors around him. And they're saying, what is your plan, Holy Father? And he says, one of the first things I must do is travel. They said, where are you going to travel to? He says, I'm going to go see Our Lady of Guadalupe in uh, Mexico City. And they say, that might not be the best thing for you to do right off the bat, Holy Father. There's a lot of work to be done here, and that's a long trip. And the Mexican government isn't very favorable to the Catholic Church. And John Paul II says, the bishops of Central and South America have invited me to come, and I shall come. And that's exactly what he did. In 1979, in the spring, he flew to Mexico City. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the, some of his advisors didn't know if he was going to get a good reception because the government is anti-clerical. They really oppressed the church for many years. And uh, But as he was flying in, there were like a million Mexicans as a welcoming party, and they're all waving their Mexican flags. They're just so happy to see the Pope. His visit was a tremendous blessing, a tremendous success, and really began to change things in the country of Mexico. And so he went to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and there he entrusted his entire pontificate to her powerful motherly intercession. And he, as he was doing this, he was thinking very concretely of how Our Lady of Guadalupe converted millions of Aztec Indians back in 1531, right? And I'd like to tell that story again, because in some ways, Gary, we can never hear that story enough, because we all need the Virgin Mary's maternal love. We need her intercession. She wants to help us. And on December, from December 9th to December 12th in 1531, the Virgin Mary appeared to Juan Diego, a poor Aztec Indian who had converted to the Catholic faith. He was about 55 years old at this time. Mm -hmm. I think he'd been a Catholic for maybe six years. And what we have to understand is what was the context of this apparition? Only, you know, five or 10 years earlier, Cortez had come into Mexico, right? And what did he found? He found this Aztec civilization that had many things that were advanced, but it had some terrible things going on. And one of it was child sacrifice. They were sacrificing 50,000 people a year to the sun god. Mm. It was just a terrible reign of terror, people living in fear. So God sent the Virgin Mary to bring a word of hope and to bring an invitation to turn to Jesus. And the Virgin Mary appeared to Juan Diego. She told him, go to the bishop, whose name was Zumaraga, and tell him that I want a chapel built on this hill, which was called Tepeyac Hill. And because there I want to lead people to my son and healing, strength, transformation. Juan went to the bishop, but the bishop said to him, um, well, you, you go back to this woman and you ask her for a sign because I have to really know that it's the Virgin Mary. And so Juan humbly goes back to the Virgin Mary and he says to her, beautiful mother, I think you better get someone with more political standing, social standing than me because I didn't make very much impact on the bishop. And she says to him, oh no, Juan, you are my man. You go again, but this time you go up on the hillside. This was December 12th. You go up the hillside and pick the roses that are there. And he goes up on top of this hill and he finds these Castilian roses. They didn't really even exist up in, at that time in Mexico. And, and they're in beautiful bloom. So he cuts them and brings them down and she arranges them in his tilma, which is his little cloak that he wears. He goes to the bishop's headquarters and he gets into the bishop's office. And he says, Bishop, now I have your sign. And so he unfolds his tilma, and the rose, as the rose, roses tumble on the ground, the bishop drops to his knees because instantaneously he sees the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe imprinted on Juan Diego's tilma. And so, of course, the bishop has that chapel built. What happened after that? From 1531, Gary, to 1541, a 10-year period, 
nine million Aztec Indians were converted to the Catholic faith. They came to the shrine, they saw the image, the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and they listened to the Franciscans tell the story how Jesus, the Son of God, was sent born of this woman. By them. And the whole tilma spoke to them in a very powerful way because the Virgin Mary appeared as a mestiza woman. That means a combination of Spanish and Mexican. And also she wore a little black bow, which meant she was with child. So as the Franciscans explained to the Aztec Indians that the child in the womb of this mother is Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, the Savior of the world, they totally got it. And they, part of the reason they got it was because the Virgin Mary was standing in front of the sun, blocking its rays, and they worshiped the sun god. So they interpreted this as meaning that Mary was more powerful than their sun god. Franciscans that were doing the baptisms, they, one of them wrote in his journal, I started baptizing at 7 a.m. this morning. I'm still baptizing at 7 p.m. at night. He says, I can't lift the water anymore to pour for baptism. So they were doing several hundreds of baptisms a day. And so John Paul II understood all this very well. He understood that his job as Pope was to help lead a new evangelization in the Catholic Church throughout the world. And he wanted Our Lady of Guadalupe right there by his side, interceding, praying with him to Jesus to draw down these graces of evangelization. And she still is the, I'll say, the queen of evangelization, the new evangelization, because her image is everywhere. Yeah. And not just in the Catholic Church. It's, in, it's out in the, it's used by the secular world often. You, I like to say it, but you see it on uh, tattoo parlors, men getting that image in their body ink. So she is the new evangelization. And again, that tilma, what was it made out of? It was made out of cactus fiber. And scientists said that cactus fiber, and they did tests on this, they got cactus fiber and tested how long it took to deteriorate. It'd be deteriorated in, in less than 20 years. And this tilma is over 1531. It's over 450 years old, right? Yeah. So it's amazing. And I've seen it's now behind bulletproof glass. People have tried to damage it and yeah. have, have always failed. It's down. It's a, in a beautiful area of Mexico City at a tremendous, I guess I'll call it a chapel, but it, mm -hmm. it can have, it's a pilgrimage site to see a miracle in our lifetime. And so I think in a previous episode, I mentioned that they used electronic microscopes on it. They looked in the ten, uh, pupils of her eyes and they could see the reflection of the bishop in his awe when the tilma was unfolded. All unfolded. So, and furthermore, they've examined like the scientists have tried to figure out, like, how was this put on? How was this image put on that tilma? It is not paint. They can't figure out any known process to man that put it there. And when they put the high-powered microscopes on it, the image seems to float on top of the fibers. So it's a miraculous image. And miracles do take place. Amen. And uh, Amen. You, you, I'm sure there's some people that... It, that are not listening, that don't believe in miracles, but miracles take place. And if, well, we, if we could explain them, they wouldn't be miracles. I got to tell you this one miracle that happened when that original image was, was being carried in procession by the bishop and everybody up to the little chapel to be installed. Some of the local Indians got a little excited and they were shooting arrows up into the air. One of them came down and killed one of the Indians. They brought the miraculous image over to where that body was and prayed. And that person was brought back to life. And so many miracles have been worked, have been, have occurred through this image. Jesus is the one working the miracle. But when you carry this image, you're asking Mary to pray with you to Jesus. And because she's the mother of Jesus, her prayer is very powerful and draws down all kinds of healing and miraculous graces. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you want, the chapel is still there. And if you want to climb up that chapel, you better be in pretty darn good shape. I, I, I was winded. I think I... Isn't those, it about 200 and some steps? Yeah, it's a hike. It's a hike. But it's definitely... So we... And this is our fourth episode. Again, thank you for all the fan mail and uh, the applause. We can hear it. 
We've mentioned the pilgrimage to the shrine in Washington, D.C., of Our Lady of Immaculate Conception to the John Paul II Center. You need to go to Mexico City if you're able to see this miracle live in your lifetime. I'm sure that it had a long-standing powerful effect on John Paul II. Exactly. Exactly. And Paul II said as Pope, his job is to evangelize and to be a living witness of Jesus Christ and his love and mercy for each person of the world. And he also said that everyone has to share in this work. He said that the most important work of the church is evangelization. And as we're all aware in the last half of the 1900s, say 1970 to 2000, there there was a great secular, secularization that went on, right? And so John Paul II knew that this needed to be addressed, and he needed to strengthen existing Catholics and proclaim our faith throughout the world. And so in 1998, he wrote a document, an apostolic exhortation called Ecclesia in America, quote, an encounter with the living Jesus Christ, the way to conversion, communion, and solidarity. So in this document, John Paul II lays out the plan for the new evangelization, especially this one, because it's called Ecclesia in America, is for the new evangelization for North America, Central America, and South America. And so he went in 1999, he went to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe with this document, and he placed it before the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe and trusted this work to her. And that shows you how much he knows how important she is to this work uh, of evangelization. Yeah, again, surrendering, surrendering himself to Jesus Christ through Mary. We just talked earlier in this episode about confirmation. And so once you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, really, you've been given a mission. Am I correct in that? And that is to go out and evangelize. Exactly. That doesn't mean you need to knock on every door in your neighborhood and say, have you heard the the good news? But you need to um, lead your life in a way that proclaims the the gospel. And so at the end of Mass, the the deacon usually says, go forth and share the gospel. There's there's several different phrases that are used in Right. But basically, we need to go out there and evangelize. And was it what was attributed to St. Francis of Assisi? Didn't he? Yeah, he said that each one of us must go out and evangelize and, if necessary, use words. So he means the first way of evangelization is through our actions. Our actions speak louder than our words. So our actions of charity, our actions of forgiveness and mercy. And that's what we're called to do, and we're called to do it together. And that's why it's important for all of our listeners to get involved, get involved in some group that's doing something to help others. And as you do something, even if it's only in a small group of five people, God's going to bless that work and it's going to grow. And that's part of the secret of becoming saints. We don't change the world in a day. We start where we are now and let God change us and then let God change the people that we're serving. And that way we can have confidence, and we don't have to be worrying about it all the time. Now, one thing I wanted to point out, and this is what John Paul II was doing, is when he went, he went to Guadalupe first in 1979, right, to entrust his pontificate to Our Lady Guadalupe. He goes back in in the 1990s. He went from 1990 to 2002. He went about five more times. And in 1999, he beatified Juan Diego, And then in 2002, he canonized him. Now, this is very significant, Gary, because think about it. It took over 400 years for the church to recognize Juan Diego first as beatified and then canonized, right? John Paul II did this because Juan Diego was a very simple man and a very holy man. He was very obedient to God's will. For the last 10 years of his life or whatever, I think he lived at least 10 years, after Our Lady appeared, he was a spokesman for Our Lady at that little chapel daily. He would explain to the Indians that came there that wanted to know really what happened when she appeared. He would tell the story. And so he became a living witness of that apparition. And so he was carrying out 
his call his baptiz- of his baptism, right? The baptismal call to go and make disciples of all nations. Juan Diego is a great saint for you and me because he was simple, he was humble, but he was obedient and he was persevering. And for you and me and all of us to be fruitful in the spiritual life, we need the humility, we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient to the teachings of Jesus Christ, which are given to us by the church, and we need to persevere. We can't just give up at the first sign of op- opposition, right? It, and that's exactly what St. John Paul II showed us. He didn't give up. He, he surrendered. Mm-hmm. He was humble in the fact that he met every person where they were, whether they were um, a high government official or a low worker in the field. Um, he shared personal relationships and never gave up, and which led to the fall of the communist regime. So Exactly. Um, you, know, you and I are fortunate. We are here again at Our Lady of Corpus Christi in the sparkling city by the sea, Corpus Christi. It's the home of naval aviation training, and we've been able to meet with young Catholic naval aviators, student naval aviators. And it's just so impressive to meet these young men and women that are so involved in their faith in their early 20s. Exactly. And of course, they know they're going into harm's way. They know they're going to be in a rough and tumble world. And they said, how do I share my faith in that world? And you and I told them, lead your life so that others want to know what is it that he has or she has that <laughs> makes them so peaceful, that makes them calm in mm-hmm. difficult uh, situations. And naval aviation, calmness really makes for the uh, better pilot. Now, humility, that's another thing we got to work on, but <laughs> they definitely lead your life so that others want what you have. So, Father, what else did, so we go back to the Pope loved Our Lady of Guadalupe. Right. You have designed this chapel, Our Lady of Corpus Christi, with Our Lady of Guadalupe in mind, with the gold stars for the new evangelization. So why are we calling it the new evangelization and not just evangelization? Because John Paul II wants us to have a new vigor, a freshness, relying on the Holy Spirit to give us the language to reach the hearts of other people. That's why we do the Holy Spirit prayer at the beginning of each one of our shows, because we know that the Holy Spirit knows the words that will best reach this person out there, that we don't even know they're there, but they're listening by radio. And we sometimes don't even know why we're telling this specific story, but because we've surrendered to the Holy Spirit, he prompts us to say that story. And this new evangelization is a freshness, because some people that have been Catholics for years, they've fallen into the doldrums. They're not really living their faith with very much intensity. And John Paul II knew that we have to reinvigorate these people and then also reach out beyond that. And of course, the rosary is one of the special ways of doing that. And in the year 2002 to 2003, John Paul II wrote an, he declared that a year of the rosary. And prior to the start of that year, he wrote an apostolic exhortation on the rosary in which he gave us five new mysteries of the rosary, which are the the luminous. Lumin- yeah, the, the luminous, luminous yeah. mysteries. Thursday night, I'll be praying the joyful mysteries, live streaming that for healing of our classmates from the Naval Academy. And as you said, start small. Do one right. little thing. As an yep. example, my friend and classmate from the Naval Academy, we said we've got classmates in need of healing prayer and people text prayer hands. And I said, hey, I've got this capability. Let's live stream a rosary. Mm-hmm. And it has been it was just simple. We said, let's commit yeah. to three, doing this three times, okay. once a month for three times. It's, we're now doing our 16th month and the crowd is growing. So excellent. do do one simple thing. Yeah. Do, if, if it's say a rosary or say, find friends, say, hey, let's do it. Let's do, have you thought about, it? let's do a rosary together. Exactly. You know? Yeah. When you do it together, it's even more powerful, right? Doing yeah. it by ourselves is good, but doing it together with others is even more powerful. And I think when you do it with a, a friend, at the end of it, you feel this peace come yeah. over you. Clean. And you go, let's just spend a couple of moments in reflection. Mm-hmm. Just let it wash over you. So uh, I, a young priest that I met uh, doing, you've heard of many Hail Marys, these uh, women that do a rosary every mm-hmm. morning. They had me on the show, but I did it with Father Carlos from up in New York City, a young, dynamic priest. Mm -hmm. And he shared with, if you're depressed, 
If you're feeling blue, how about getting up in the morning, doing 30 minutes exercise, do 30 minutes of prayer, Amen. then do 30 minutes to help or to make someone else other than yourself happy. Wow, that's powerful. And then do 30 minutes on your own self, something right. that makes you happy. But okay, if you can't do 30 minutes, how about doing 10 minutes of exercise, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes to make somebody else happy, and 10 minutes on yourself? But you start your day like that and do that for a week, and it's going to be transformational, and you'll be on your way to being a saint. So, Father, let's wrap up. How about give us a blessing? Yes. Okay. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless each one of you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity with your host, Father James Kelleher, here at the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. You can find more information at salt.net, S-O-L-T dot net. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the next episode.